What do you know about Everest, the highest peak on Earth? Conquering Everest is one of the most demanding achievements for climbers. Picture this, a relentless ascent into the unforgiving heights, where every step is a battle against nature. But beware, because attempting Everest without experience can be like signing your own death sentence. Going back to the late 1980s and early 90s, climbing Everest was reserved for the seasoned few who dared to challenge it. Fast forward to today, and Everest has transformed from a pursuit of passion to what can be called a tourist trap. Some may even call it a death trap, where inexperienced climbers are taken to the summit by Sherpas and seasoned guides. The question, is this trend killing the joy of climbing and putting climbers at risk? To answer this question, let's go back to May 10, 1996. Multiple groups set out to summit Everest as they reached the summit behind schedule. What unfolded was one of the darkest chapters in the mountain's history. Um, you know, for people that have paid me, it's pretty much my job to, I guess, number one, keep them alive, and um, number two, to do everything we can to get them to the summit. Located in the Himalayas, one mountain stands out among the snow-capped peaks. Mount Everest stands tall, a colossal giant, at a breathtaking 29,000 feet or almost 9,000 meters. This is no ordinary mountain. The summit on Everest is the holy grail of mountain climbing. Spanning the border between Nepal and Tibet, the Himalaya showed two sides of Everest, the south face in Nepal and the famous north face in Tibet. These nations, heavily reliant on climbers drawn to Everest, offer a unique view of the mountain's beauty. Let's talk about the climb. It's not for the faint of heart. Seasoned climbers often go for the harder northern face, but before the ascent, climbers go to what's known as base camp, a temporary home where climbers acclimate for days, battling the dangers of altitude sickness before taking on the ultimate challenge. Now let's talk about timing. Summer might seem like the best time to conquer Everest, but that's not the case. The unpredictable monsoon season throws a curveball, forcing climbers to favor the time between spring and autumn. Everest climate is not your typical holiday destination. As you can imagine, temperatures at the summit never go above freezing. Even in the middle of summer, in January, bridges offer an average summit temperature of minus 32 degrees Fahrenheit, plunging to a spine chilling minus 76 degrees. Up there, Mother Nature is in charge and predicting the weather on the summit is close to impossible. Imagine planning your ascent within a short two-week window. Now picture this, climbers gearing up, embarking on their journey weeks in advance, navigating this treacherous path. The entire ascent, a daunting 60-day expedition, demands careful planning. Yet, even with all the preparation, there's one place that remains unconquerable, the dev zone. When I initially began to come around, I thought I was in my own bed. It was pleasant, it was warm, I was not the least bit uncomfortable. There was nothing to hurt because all the parts that were exposed were dead. And dead flesh doesn't hurt. Venturing beyond the towering heights of 26,000 feet, we entered the chilling realm known simply as the Dev Zone, a place where survival becomes a literal race against time. At these altitudes, oxygen is a rare treasure, a lifeline that slips through your fingers. Linger too long, and the consequences are nothing short of fatal. We are finely tuned for sea level, where oxygen plays the perfect melody for our bodies. But up there, the lack of oxygen wrecks havoc. To conquer Everest, Climbers must confront the challenge that is the dev zone, a region so hostile that even breathing becomes a luxury. Oxygen levels get so low, it becomes a breeding ground for hypoxia in this desolate environment. Our organs start a slow and agonizing descent into death, cell by cell, minute by minute. People compare the experience to running a marathon on a treadmill while attempting to breathe through a straw. Once inside the dev zone, the clock starts ticking. Summit the peak and descent quickly or succumb to the conditions. But here's where the danger escalates. 
is when you thought it couldn't get any worse, imagine this. You see the summit, but from the corner of your eyes, you see something that seems strange, especially at this altitude, a line overcrowding. When the Everest Express hits a bottleneck, the stakes skyrocket. Delays in the summit attempt means extended exposure to the unforgiving dev zone. This will lead to the series of unfortunate events to come. It was a very black wall of clouds coming from behind Tawichi, further down the valley. Coming in low, unlike a lot of storms that start high, this storm was coming quite low and was obviously very fast moving, very intense. In a few minutes, I saw the mountains of Tawichi disappear. Going back in time to March 1996, multiple climbing groups embarked on a weeks long journey to conquer the peak from both the Nepalese and Tibetan sides. Among these groups were adventure consultants and mountain madness. As these climbers reached Camp 4, they were met with unexpectedly strong winds. Guides kept an eye on the ever changing weather. Then at 8 pm, a chilling calm wind and clear skies signal a potential window to summit. Rob Hall of Adventure Consultants and Scott Fisher of Mountain Madness recognized the need for safety measures. The number of climbers was high, so safety became an issue. Rob set a final turnaround time, 2 p.m. This turnaround time would foreshadow the issues at the summit. Fisher and Hall decided to join forces, sending lead Sherpas to blaze the trail. However, miscommunication gripped the mountaineer, and the Sherpas abandoned the plan which would again add to the series of issues. As the clock ticked towards midnight on May 10th, the ascent began, but bottlenecks quickly plagued the route, transforming key points like the balcony and Hillary Step into challenging obstacles, slowing the movement of even the most seasoned climbers. Fast forward to mid-morning, some climbers chose safety over the summit, choosing to descend despite the significant investment in their climb. Among them was Beck Weathers, who started suffering from snow blindness and waited for Hall's return on a ledge near the balcony. Meanwhile, at the forefront of the group, Mountain Madness guide Anatoly Bukriev defied the odds, reaching the summit at 1.07 p.m. without supplemental oxygen. Others followed suit, reaching the summit by 1.25 p.m. As the clock struck 2 p.m., danger loomed as climbers were still ascending. Despite Bukriev helping out the climbers for nearly one and a half hours, he began his descent alone at 2.30 p.m. as more climbers reached the summit after 3 p.m., well beyond the turnaround time. Snow began to fall. At 5.15 he called and he said that Doug was weak and, um, yes, I, I could tell things were very serious. As Rob Hall and Doug Hansen approached the Hillary Step at 3 p.m., Sherpas descended from the summit. When legendary Sherpa Ang Dorji encountered Hansen, he told him to descend, but Hansen simply shook his head and pointed towards the summit. Rob stepped in, directing Sherpas to assist other climbers, while he stayed back with Hansen. Ang Dorji offered to take Hansen quickly to the summit, but Rob refused. Meanwhile, descending climbers found Beck Weathers on the balcony. Weathers, despite being offered help, declined. As the clock ticked towards 3.45 p.m., an exhausted Scott Fisher, possibly suffering from altitude sickness, reached the summit, followed by Taiwanese guide Makalu Gao. Close to 4 p.m., despite heavy snowfall, Rob and Hansen finally reached the summit, a staggering two hours past the final turnaround time. Rob radioed base camp, alerting them to their position. At 4.30 p.m., Rob radioed that Hansen had collapsed but was still alive. Despite the advice to leave Hansen behind, Rob chose to not abandon him and stayed. But the mountain had other plans. At 5.15 p.m., Rob again signaled his movements to base camp, and by 3.35 p.m., he remained unable to move Hansen, resisting the idea of leaving him behind. Guide Andy Harris ascended with supplies towards the summit, racing against time. And then at 6 p.m., the blizzard struck with full force, impacting the 17 descending climbers. Fast forward to 10 p.m., and only half of the climbers had returned to camp. Some lost their way on the south call, foreshadowing the events to come.
I was in front of Rob Hall. I told Rob Henson, okay, it's late, it's now bad weather, we're going to down. But Doc Henson, he didn't talk to me. He just shake his head and then he's pointing his finger and summit. As the blizzard hit, climbers faced a dire situation. In the chaos of the storm, the group, a mix of mountain madness guide Neil Biederman, clients and adventure consultant climbers, gathered close to each other in the whiteout due to low visibility with ropes buried beneath the snow, unaware of how close they were to Camp 4. Back near the summit, Fisher, accompanied by Sherpa Lobsang, battled the storm but couldn't descend below the balcony. Makalu Gao, caught in the icy grip of the storm, stood paralyzed, unable to move. As the darkness of midnight approached, a break in the storm revealed the lights of Camp 4. Some of the group pressed forward to find help. Back at Camp 4, they reported the ongoing disaster. Enter Bukriev. He was able to bring some of the climbers back to safety, but his attempt to save lives sparked controversy as he faced scrutiny for prioritizing certain climbers specifically those in Mountain Madness. Back at Camp 4, exhaustion and desperation painted the scene as climbers, battered by the relentless storm, couldn't reach Yasuko Namba or Beck Weathers. The unfolding tragedy took its toll. In the ensuing chaos, Stuart Hutchison stumbled upon Weathers and Namba, their conditions critical, hanging on by a thread between life and death. But he thought they were too far gone for rescue, awakening from the brink Weathers twice presumed dead and left for nature to claim, defied the odds. He regained consciousness and descended with help over two grueling days, documenting his survival in his book Left for Dead. But the saga didn't end there. A historic rescue unfolded, orchestrated by Weathers' wife. In a historic first, a helicopter swooped in, and Weathers and Gao, both suffering from severe frostbite, were plugged from the icy jaws of Everest. What about Rob Hall? Um, do you believe he would have survived if he'd not had Doug Hansen to look after? Uh, I do, yes. Uh, Rob Hall was, was uh, such a, a magnificent climber and a survivor that uh, without Doug um, Hansen to look after, I believe he would have survived. Uh, Rob Hall stayed with him through friendship, through mateship. Not through a sense of obligation because he was a paying customer? Definitely not. Definitely not. A few hours before, in the shadow of Camp 4, Sherpas found Makalu Gao and Scott Fisher. Gao was evacuated with weathers, but fate had other plans for Fisher. The Sherpas, facing the harsh reality, deemed Fisher beyond help and left him behind. After hearing about Fisher, Bukriev attempted to rescue him, but found his lifeless body near the balcony. News from the South Summit took a turn for the worse. Rob Hall, resilient but battered, reported he survived the night at the South Summit, but Hansen was gone and Harris was missing. At 9 a.m. on May 11, Rob connected with his wife via satellite phone. In this heartbreaking moment, he chose a name for their unborn child. He assured her not to worry and said goodbye. As Everest stood a silent witness to this tragedy, Robin Hansen met their fate near the Hillary Step. Their journey finally ended. Yasuko Namba, frozen and unresponsive just above Camp 4, never woke up. As the mountain kept its secrets, the bodies of Harris and Hansen were never found. But Fisher's body, discovered among the frozen landscape, was left at his family's request. But the cruel irony didn't end there. Rob Hall's body, initially perched on the Hillary Step, fell over 12,000 feet to the base of the mountain. Last year, there were only three days in the prime season, the prime week, to go summit Everest. Normally, there's five, six, seven, eight, or even like in 2018, there were 11 consecutive days. So you can take five, 600 people, spread them out over 11 days, and just like my experience in 2011, not have a problem. But if you take five, six, 700 people, and you try to put them into three days, 
I promise you, you're going to have a problem. And that's what we saw last year. Now comes the question of what exactly happened. It's a tale of inexperience, questionable choices, and the relentless pursuit of profit. Group leaders like Rob Hall and Scott Fisher found themselves caught in the eye of a storm where nature clashed with the whispers of bad choices. But the story doesn't end there. It's a saga that echoes through the words of survivors. Enter John Krakauer's famous book, Into Thin Air, and Bukriev's The Climb, two survivors presenting contrasting viewpoints that fueled the firestorm of controversy, including Bukriev's choice not to use oxygen and his rescue efforts among the chaos. But critics will point fingers at the Everest Circus, where profit-driven motives collided with the unyielding forces of nature, blaming the over-commercialization, summit fever, and overcrowding that fueled the eventual chaos. The ruthless competition among expeditions fueled by the hunger for publicity, escalated the race to the summit, resulting in dangerous delays and a perfect storm of issues. The collaboration to reach the summit, a good idea on paper, spiraled into chaos, causing the mishandling of fixed ropes and deviations from the plan, like the controversial short roping of socialite Sandy Pittman, bottlenecks formed, slowing the ascent to a crawl. And then, against all warnings in the established turnaround time, the storm unleashed its fury. The fate of climbers lingering on the slopes were sealed by the icy hand of nature. While the 1996 disaster was one of the deadliest in history, subsequent incidents, like the 2014 avalanche that claimed the lives of 16 Sherpas, have continued to highlight the dangers of climbing this iconic peak. Enter Summit Fever. It was deemed a contributing factor pushing climbers to reach the summit despite the odds and bad conditions. A magnetic force fueled by determination and the hefty cost of attempting the climb. Despite a dip in fatality rates after the 1990s, the haunting truth remains. The death toll on Everest continues to climb, a grim reality of the commercialization and the surge in climbers. But the tragedy spilled beyond the borders of Nepal, seeping into the Tibetan side. Iconic figures like Green Boots became dark reminders of the risks taken, and David Sharp's ill-fated solo climb in the dark of night in 2006 added another dark chapter to the legacy of Everest. Bukriev, once a controversial figure in the disaster, was recognized as a hero in the storm's aftermath. Neil Biederman also etched his name in the mountain's history. These tales of rescue among the chaos would offer some hope to the shadowy narrative of Everest. Bukriev would later pay tribute to Yasuko Namba, locating her body and creating a memorial. Climbing Everest has become a product. It's a very good product. You know, I don't blame, in a way, I don't blame people also for, you know, because it's a good way to make money. Is the commercialization of Everest really causing, or at least contributing to these deaths, given the tragedy in 1996 and those after it, it's hard to argue otherwise. The mountain soaring summit has now become a site plagued by the shadows of overcrowding, commercialization, and the pursuit of profit at the expense of the climb. The allure of Everest has drawn a significant surge in climbers, transforming it into a symbol not just of conquest, but also of the chaotic and profit-driven world of modern expeditions. The mountain, once a realm for seasoned climbers, has now become a battleground for a frenzied rush to the summit. Commercialization, underscored by the race for publicity and profit, has rewritten the rules of ascending Everest. The mountain has become a platform for adventure tourism, attracting individuals from different backgrounds and experiences who seek to claim their place in history by reaching the summit at any cost. Fast forward to the realities of 2023, a year marked as its deadliest yet. With more lives lost than ever, the effects of commercialization became increasingly evident showcasing just how dangerous the pursuit of profit on Everest has become. Thank you for watching.